Okay, yep, it's coming. There it is. Yep, a little bit of perfect. Yep, we're good now. Okay. So, yeah, two, two All right. So, um, um, I'll just do a quick intro. So, hang on. Okay. All right, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, to the show. Um, I am. Uh, my name is uh, Stuart Gummins. Um, SE uh, for North America, uh, recently joined ECAHOW um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I'm here along with my um, uh, fellow, uh, fellow engineer, Abhishek. He's also on the line and uh, he is from the East Coast and I'm actually from the West Coast up in uh, Vancouver, um, BC, uh, Canada. And today we've got uh, a cool show. We've got uh, quite a few people joining the, uh, the cast so far. We've got um, uh, a good friend of ours, uh, Garrett uh, Packer. Uh, he's gonna do a little kind of thing about hospitality Wi-Fi and some of those things of, you know, what is it like to do um, uh, wireless in the hotel world, right? What's going on in that, uh, in that area, in that space? So it's always been a good topic um, for a lot of, um, a lot of people and, and kind of think, you know, is that we all stay in hotel. We all want to have good Wi-Fi and sometimes it's not so great. And, uh, and sometimes we just want to get in and out of it as quick as possible. But, you know, sometimes it's good to have a good Wi-Fi. So without further ado, I'm going to um, uh, pass the, uh, the mic over to Garrett. Awesome. Thank you for the intro, Stu. And sorry, I'm cutting you off there. And uh, yeah, thanks, Abhishek, for, for running the, uh, turning the dials and uh, flipping the switches. Um, had a little bit of fun getting into this webinar this morning. Um, yeah, like Stu said, uh, my name is Garrett. Um, I'm also from Western Canada. Um, I've been working in hospitality Wi-Fi for quite some time now. Um, my focus has been on the actual WLAN engineering side for about three and a half years. Um, uh, before that was more involved in some of the, uh, the pre-sale side of things, um, deployment strictly, but less design and, uh, and, uh, yeah, it's taken me to a lot of different places throughout North America and overseas a couple of times. Um, and everyone's aware of hospitality Wi-Fi and some of the, some of the particular challenges therein. Um, everyone's experienced terrible hosp hospitality Wi-Fi because um, it's often done poorly. Um, over the years, it has slowly improved, um, but there are still a lot of challenges that are unique to the industry because of brand mandates. Um, we're going to talk about more of those as we get into the discussion, but uh, yeah, as I said, I uh, work with a company called Liveport. Um, our primary focus is hospitality. Um, the business has been in place for about 12 years now. Um, and while we do uh, work in other market verticals, it's still kind of our primary space. All right, so um, a few things that we see in hotels all the time. Um, one big thing that, uh, that you'll come across is deployment restrictions. Um, we can't always place the APs in the best possible locations in terms of the RF environment. Um, we, can't, we can't always place uh, APs on the ceiling where they're going to operate the best and have the best coverage profiles and the most predictable RF. Um, a lot of times we're required to deploy on wall plates, um, you know, things like that, uh, that sometimes even behind furniture, which is a, a big no-no, but uh, sometimes you're forced to do it. Um, uh, a regular challenge is going to be the expansion of IoT. Um, they're coming in a lot more now, um, and we're seeing hotels, uh, you know, they get a good idea in their head potentially, but then the application turns out to be a lot more complex than they realize. Um, so trying to separate IoT ideas um, with IoT reality uh, and making sure that the hotel can deliver the experience that they're looking for, which nine times out of 10 is just like a home experience. Doesn't matter what you're talking about, whether it's the smart elements, whether it's the media, uh, whether it's just straight Wi-Fi access, uh, people want it to be simple. They want it to be effective. Um, and, and more and more now we're seeing back of house requirements. Um, we're seeing uh, housekeeping teams uh, use apps that are gonna be tied back to PMS systems. Um, they want to connect with management. They want to have uh, like, like housekeeping leadership, making sure that they're allocating resources to the appropriate places. Um, and obviously having a, a, a wireless environment allows, uh, allows staff to pretty effectively uh, keep, their, keep the, uh, the management staff as well as the uh, front desk staff uh, advised of where rooms are at in terms of status and whatnot. Um, it's also helpful for maintenance purposes. Um, it's pretty quick and easy if you have an effective um, communication grid to make sure that uh, maintenance staff know where problems potentially are. 
where they need to go and how to get them resolved quickly. Um, noted here, brand standards. I mentioned it earlier. Um, because Wi-Fi in hotels is, has such a terrible reputation, uh, a lot of, the, especially the, with the bigger brands, uh, they're trying to shift that conversation. They, they, no one's surprised now by the importance of Wi-Fi. Um, you see, you know, uh, guest and hotelier um, surveys time and time and time again. You know, 95% of guests say Wi-Fi is the most critical part of the uh, experience. 98% say they won't go back if they have a poor Wi-Fi experience, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the brand standards are trying to, they're trying to address those concerns and those very obvious uh, priorities for guests, but there, there, there are some struggles. There have been some growing pains with those brand standards. Um, too often um, the, the brand standard doesn't allow for enough uh, nuance and, and anyone that works in Wi-Fi knows that uh, it, there's the hard and fast rules don't really exist. The, you know, the trademark, it depends um, uh, that Sam Clements is, is well known for that. That's it's, it's very true here just as it is in any other Wi-Fi environment. So trying to trying to work around those brand standards is sometimes actually more detrimental than positive. So that's a, that's a challenge that you have to look for when you're doing uh, hotel Wi-Fi. Um, site access. Um, Stu and I were chatting a couple of days ago about uh, one of his experiences in, um, in hospitality and he noted the, the challenge um, of just simple room access to say, do your validation surveys. Um, that's something we obviously have to deal with all the time. Um, but if you work, if you work well with the, with the management team, um, you're going to be able to allocate the time and resources to do it. Um, we'll talk about it a bit more, but if there's one thing I can say about hospitality Wi-Fi is don't skimp on the validation survey side. Um, and as much as it pains me to say this, if you have to, if you absolutely have to cut somewhere in terms of survey work, um, it's usually going to be on the front end, you know, you're, you're planning surveying. Um, and the primary reason for that is because sometimes those brand standards have a mandate for, uh, you know, an AP per room or an AP every second room, et cetera. Um, and if you, if you don't have an option as to when and where you deploy your APs, um, there's going to be less value in that planning survey and more value in the validation so that you can tweak and tune accordingly. Um, captive portals, um, the dirty, the dirty word in the, uh, the WLAN industry. Um, it, it's, it's obviously rampant in hospitality. Um, you know, you'll get the argument that it's there for legal purposes. Uh, but a lot of times, uh, hotels and hotel brands in general, are, they're more looking just for, you know, uh, I don't know how effective it is necessarily, but um, they are looking for opportunities to engage their guests, provide a little bit of information about necessarily the hotel that they're in, um, just the brand in general, and trying to drive a little bit of recurring uh, bookings. Um, so I can see, I can see why it's there. Um, but obviously the challenge in captive portals is that it's, uh, that clients, uh, client drivers and whatnot define really how that's going to work. Um, and so that's probably one of the most recurring challenges for us is, uh, having some kind of big, you know, iOS update, Android update, whatnot. Um, and it changes the behavior of the captive portals. Uh, and then you have the captive portal providers scrambling to update and adjust accordingly. So how do we approach each project in Wi-Fi? Um, in, in the case of hospitality, um, we approach it pretty similar to any other project in any other vertical we, uh, we work in. Um, obviously there's some unique aspects to, to hospitality, but um, we still try to stick with the tried and true approach. Um, for us, the customer education element is a lot more important in hospitality than it is in some other verticals. Um, part of that is because uh, with a lot of other verticals, we're typically working with, um, with IT professionals. Um, so the education is important. Wi-Fi is a widely misunderstood um, technology and medium, uh, but, uh, but there's at least a, a basis of understanding there when it comes to, to protocols and whatnot. Um, in the hospitality market, um, there's often no IT person on staff. Um, there's often, you know, you, you'll have the, uh, the night accountant who also happens to like know how to use his iPhone and he's, uh, you know, he's the IT guy for the hotel. Um, so we have that challenge to deal with. Um, when we're lucky, uh, we're dealing with a larger block of hotels or, you know, some of our larger chain clients. Um, obviously, in those cases, we're working with IT people and there's, there's less of a learning curve. Uh, but when we're talking about small groupings of hotels, uh, you know, the say like different brands, different flags that are managed by a single group or a single company, 
um, that education component is really important. If, if ownership and management understand some of the underlying challenges and uh, complicated nature of Wi-Fi, they're more likely to, to make good choices and commit to a process that's going to work for them. Um, so yeah, I, helping them understand what they need uh, leads us into the conversation about what the, what the site actually requires in terms of Wi-Fi. There are a lot of hotels that have zero, well, in their, at least they'll, they'll say they have zero need for Wi-Fi for any back of house requirements. Um, but oftentimes, uh, you know, we'll present a couple of potential use cases and they'll, they'll potentially, you know, you know, oh, okay, yeah, I know that would be really nice to have, or that'd be great to have, or we have to have that. Um, so defining your requirements beforehand is obviously critical. Um, in hotel environments, there's a lot of spaces um, that can be challenging to provide coverage in. Uh, a lot of times you'll have service elevators um, that uh, don't have any interconnectivity with the, with the, uh, you know, the thoroughways that the guests are in. Um, and more often than not, you're talking about a tower with a, with a, you know, a concrete structure through the middle with all of your elevators. Um, and a lot of hotels are looking for coverage in those spaces. So you have to plan for those. Um, when, you, uh, when you get to the survey stage, um, we like to use a combination of, uh, of methods. Um, and I've, it, I'm very open to hearing other methods too, because uh, you always have to kind of shift and be on, be, be on the ready to adjust what you're doing. Um, when it comes to typical hotel builds, um, we like to go in and ensure that there's a consistency with the, A, the floor plans we're given, um, that's always step number one, make sure that everything that we're seeing so that when we do our projections, it's going to, we know it's going to be valid. Um, furthermore, um, we want to make sure that if there's anything that's kind of odd from one floor to another floor, that that's obviously factored in. Um, and when we go through, um, in an ideal situation, we actually do uh, what we refer to as attenuation surveying, where we're actually measuring the attenuation of each wall uh, in the facility. Um, and we'll get the, sometimes, uh, you know, we'll get the question of like, well, is it really worth doing all of it? Um, I would say most times it is. Um, but again, with, with potential budget constraints uh, and time constraints in a hospitality environment, um, we try to at least have a, a good representation of the building. So um, obviously, a lot of hotels are going to be the same from floor to floor to floor. Um, and so we, you know, we try to look for uh, a level where you're looking at maybe, you know, um, less return on your time investment. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're just looking at a typical box hotel with a hundred rooms, you know, four floors, 25 rooms, something like that. Um, you know, maybe we'll just survey out two floors, um, survey out all the, uh, the top and bottom attenuation and make sure that we're good there. Just a little less disruption for the guests, a little disruption for the staff. Um, but there are clients, um, that have a much more higher sensitivity, um, in terms of post install performance. Um, they're looking for a lot more in terms of service. They want to deliver IPTV services over the Wi-Fi. Um, they want to deliver, they want to have guest streaming and whatnot. Um, uh, for properties like that, we're always aiming to get a hundred percent, uh, coverage when it comes to testing and surveying. Um, and then above and beyond the attenuation surveying, we're also going to do some AP on a stick work. Um, where we're going to take either A, the mandated uh, AP uh, or the AP that, uh, that we've recommended to the client based on their requirements. Um, and we're going to do some, some testing where we're, we're taking our sidekick and we're taking in our testing equipment and we're checking the cell sizes, uh, looking for the edges, trying to see if they're, you know, trying to confirm that we've got a consistent shape to ourselves and whatnot uh, so we can plan accordingly. Well, that's, yeah, that's pretty cool, uh, uh, Gary. So, um, I mean, maybe we uh, jumping ahead here, but I mean, how do you, when you talk about the the, the design and the and the survey, I mean, hotels have the most crazy aesthetics, right? You like the, you can't, you know, there's like ceilings and whatnot that you can't even, you know, think of how do am I going to get an AP there, right? Or or you come into a grand ballroom and you're like, oh wow, there's crown molding everywhere, right? It's uh, <laughs> it's like what do I put things, right? Totally. Yeah. Like obviously hotels want to maintain a certain aesthetic appeal. Um, some are going to be a lot more sensitive than others. Um, we, I, I won't say who, but there are, there are a couple of larger brands that we work with that have, uh, they've mandated Meraki uh, infrastructure throughout for all of their properties. Um, and um, like our, 
our company's vendor agnostic. So we work with multiple AP vendors. And if it was a, you know, if it was an independent hotel um, or an independent chain, we may recommend something different in, in a given scenario. But when you're, when you're locked into a particular uh, vendor solution, um, it's really, really helpful when they have uh, different options in terms of uh, AP model uh, antennas. Uh, so yes, so speaking on Meraki, uh, when, they, when they released external AP models, that was very, very helpful uh, in that regard um, because there were situations, you mentioned, mentioned ballrooms um, and something like crown molding everywhere. Um, <laughs> there are times when crown molding is used as the vehicle for getting cabling to where you need it. Um, but those external AP models also help us to, to match an aesthetic um, by allowing us to kind of, you know, discreetly hide the, the access point itself, uh, but have the, the antenna um, mounted in a way that's, that's pretty non-invasive, but also allows us to, to really get the RF where we need it and how we need it. So that's, that's helpful for sure. Um, so, and uh, yeah, no, go ahead. So we got a really good actually question from, uh, from Nick Smith here. He says, you know, where do you, where do you find you spend the most of your time in your four step approach? Uh, do you find that customers have patience for going through the requirements gathering process that enables you to get to the level of detail that you require? Um, I would say now I would say yes. If you asked me that a couple of years ago, <laughs> I would say a hard no. Um, and a lot of it just ha comes down to, again, the, the, the education element, um, especially with our long-term clients. Um, we've worked with them enough and they've seen the, they've seen the results uh, to kind of to validate and, and give value to that planning process. Um, when it comes to the actual time on site, um, the, you know, the planning and design portion uh, of our surveying, uh, you know, steps, um, don't really take a whole lot longer than say the implementation. Um, in a lot of ways, the actual deployment, uh, is, is certainly the, the least time sensitive element and it often is done the fastest, um, because it's, it's pretty straightforward. Once our design is done, this is going here, here, and here, we've got to get somebody in there and let's do it. And then you schedule it accordingly. Um, obviously when you're talking about surveying for your design work, um, you don't know what you're going to run into. So that often does take longer. Um, like a recent example would be, uh, a site where, um, we did our typical, uh, you know, brief interviews on site where we're, we're connecting with maintenance staff or connecting with management. Um, we're asking staff about pain points, like where, where do you currently have issues with your Wi-Fi network? Um, because even if we, even if we know we're, we're, in, and obviously we're talking about a retrofit situation here, like an existing building. Um, if we know where some of their existing challenges are, um, you know, we're going to take a little bit of extra time on those spaces to ensure it's not something like an interferer um, or some unknown hidden specter in the wall. Um, in a recent survey, uh, we discovered, you know, as every third room, um, we were seeing this huge variance uh, in the wall attenuation as you move side to side. Um, and the plans didn't show anything that would kind of give us a clue as to what it was. Um, but after doing a, you know, a couple of floors of the hotel, it became pretty obvious that this was consistent. Um, and so the maintenance uh, staff actually reached out to their old uh, supervisor uh, who had left the, left the, I think he'd retired actually about, you know, two, three years ago, whatever it was. And he confirmed, he's like, oh yeah, I was there when it was getting built. There's, st there's steel pillars um, you know, and he kind of described where they were. I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So uh, if, if we hadn't surveyed out those couple of floors and been very consistent in our survey work, we wouldn't have ever found it. Um, and in, in that instance, it would have actually, not dramatically, but it would have definitely impacted the RF coverage um, going from room to room. Um, so it, that kind of, that extra work um, in that case, you know, the, the value is pretty obvious. In other cases where you don't find anything uh, odd or awkward, um, it's harder to, to show that value. Uh, but again, once, once you've completed your design and you've completed the installation and the, and the system works as well as you promise, you know, the old adage of, um, under promise over deliver, um, that holds true. And a lot of hotels have been burnt with poor Wi-Fi design and poor Wi-Fi, uh, installations in the past. Uh, and so, it can, yeah, it can be a bit of a challenge to help get people to a point where they understand that this process is valuable because it'll lead to a better end result. That's uh, that's really cool. 
Um, we've got a lot. We've got quite a few good questions in here actually coming up. Um, some of them okay. are going to probably not line up with a couple of your your slides, which is actually pretty good. Um, but um, one one good question here is since we're talking about um, serving and rooms and whatnot, and uh, maybe you can just briefly touch on this and um, is uh, you know what what kind of um, did you did you see any kind of performance hits when you uh, when you're forced to mount EPs behind TVs at all? Yes, absolutely. Um, so that's one thing. It, it's nice when we're working with clients that are, you know, building or acquiring older buildings and renovating. Um, there's a trust factor there. They know that our recommendations are valid. Um, when you're talking about a new client and, and where you're forced to go into a retrofit situation, um, sometimes you don't have the option to deploy in best practice locations. Um, you can't necessarily place the AP up in the ceiling. Um, you may not even be able to put it in an, an accessible height if you're talking about a wall plate installation. Um, there are tons and tons of in installations where the APs are actually behind like a heavy desk or an armoire, that type of thing. Um, and, you know, obviously there's going to be an impact there. Um, it becomes, and that I touched on this at the very beginning, but um, that's why the, the post validation survey becomes so critical. Um, those, those placements, uh, you just, you sometimes can't, can't make a change. Um, because a lot of hotels want to leverage their existing legacy wired infrastructure. Um, and the reality is nine times out of 10, even if that in room infrastructure is not in an ideal location, um, it's still going to be, uh, it's still going to be many times better than, uh, if they're to go with reusing, you know, hallway cabling. Um, or putting in new hallway cabling, God forbid. Um, we see that uh, it's become much, much less common now for brands to mandate hallway-based APs. Um, in those instances, you the, the AP on a stick element is much more valuable in my opinion. Um, but when you're talking about in-room AP deployment, even if you're dealing with challenging placement locations, um, you're still going to have a better end result because you can, you can, you can use, uh, obviously the walls, but even use things like heavy furniture to help contain your cells, um, and make sure that you've, you, you, you minimize your co-channel interference. Um, and you've got good channelization and you're still going to have good experiences for the guests because they're, even with those added barriers, um, and added challenges that you're still going to have client devices so close to the AP um, that you don't see a lot of drop off in terms of data rate and throughputs. Well, that's pretty slick. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, and I'll just, uh, I'm going to touch on some of the tools here that we use. I've already talked about serving, jumped over a couple of slides because we kind of just naturally covered them uh, with a couple of the questions, but um, when we're doing our attenuation surveying, um, that at least that's what we call it. <laughs> Other people have different names for it. Um, we'll use an air check G2. Um, we're gonna use a mobile AP as our signal source. Um, and we've kinda, we kinda use a hybrid of a couple of different uh, methods. One method I learned years ago from uh, at an ECSC class with Devin Aiken. Um, and another one of my colleagues took a class with Keith Parsons and he had a slightly different approach. While they both used the air check G2, um, Devin, uh, used a process where he would, you know, check free, free space path loss with a, you know, six meter, uh, test. Um, and then he would add his attenuation surfaces in between and kind of maintain that distance and measure the difference. So it makes sense. Um, but there are some challenges with that, that, uh, make it a little harder to get down to the granular detail of walls, especially when you're talking about closed or cramped spaces, you know, like small hotel bathrooms. Um, even trying to measure uh, the full scope of a closet, for example, they seem like small and potentially unimportant. Um, but if you're repeating that same thing 100, 100 or 200 or 500 times, uh, you want to get it right. Um, and so Keith had taught this method where you actually place the, the G2 kind of at the wall, you measure on one side, you go around to the other side, place it on the opposite side of the wall and get your, get your loss measurement. Um, now, I, and I've heard lots of good arguments against both of those methods. I've heard lots of good arguments for them. Um, it's partly why we don't rely on a single method and also why we uh, validate our checks with uh, AP on a stick um, because we can go in, we can map out our site uh, in Ekahau with the measurements we got with those air check tests and the mobile AP. Um, and then we can contrast our AP on a stick readings um, that we gathered during the same survey work and then compare them against uh, what we're seeing in the projections. Um, and if we're doing, if we're doing it well, 
we're going to be pretty close. Uh, and then we know we can we can count on the predictive survey, um, or I'll call it like the actual uh, simulated environment. Um, what we see there is going to be close enough to reality that when we go in and do our post install survey, that we can make the minor tweaks needed to just get it tuned just the way we want it. Um, now, one thing I'll I'll point out to anyone that maybe hasn't done much surveying in a hotel before. Um, you're talking about pretty, again, pretty small spaces. Uh, you know, a typical hotel room is like 12 by 24. Um, and if you're looking to measure a wall from one side to the other, you don't, you, you need more, more distance to get a nice, accurate reading. Um, so we do something that we, you know, very affectionately call the leapfrog approach. Um, and we'll actually set up our mobile AP in room, you know, one. We'll move over to room three and, and measure it on either side of the wall between room two and room three. Um, I unfortunately don't have something to illustrate that here, but um, feel free for anyone to you know reach out if you want to get a better understanding of how that works. I can definitely send it to you over like a direct message or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's how we take that approach. We're extending out the distance from the AP to the measurement tool to make sure that we have a more accurate reading, um, and we're not relying on uh, we're not relying on that ramp. Um, that you know that high loss of signal over the initial few meters um, and it's a little flatter once we get a little further out so we always want to be at least four to five meters away from the access point source well that's actually pretty uh, a good little method i actually uh, want to know more about that for sure i mean that, that falls into a question that uh, uh, peter rock had was uh, what method do you use to accurately determine the attenuation of a hotel floor and yeah asking that you know wi-fi knowledge will um, suggests that a method of determining attenuation of a wall. However, this requires a transmitter to be placed some meters from the wall. And I think you were you were you were uh, suggesting that in your in, in the way your method was in, in a way. Yeah, certainly. And, and sorry, can you just read that question back for me again? I just want to make sure I got it right. Yeah. So he said, "What method do you use to accurately determine the attenuation of a hotel floor?" Gotcha. Okay. So we use a very similar approach actually. Um, and I was going to describe that actually. Um, so the, that first method I described where you're looking to get a five or a six meter free space path loss measurement. So you get kind of a baseline. Um, and just for the sake of argument, let's say um, we're in the hotel environment and we, we check our six meter distance and we get a, a reading of neg 55, just as an example. Um, we'll take that mobile AP uh, we'll place it, uh, you know, wherever we need. It doesn't really particularly matter. We typically aim for at least three points um, in the uh, per floor at least, um, and then we'll do a similar process. We'll place the AP. We'll have one tech AP side and one tech uh, with the G2, um, and they'll actually proceed up two floors or down two floors, whatever the case may be. Um, and then we're going to measure our distance from the AP to the ceiling and then measure the floor between and make sure we're again getting that six meter distance, albeit in a vertical domain rather than horizontal. And we'll do the same thing, we'll measure our loss. Um, and we commonly see, you know, anywhere from, you know, neg 12 to neg 20 dBs is typical floor attenuation in a hotel environment. Sometimes it's a little less, um, it's rare for it to be more than that. Um, and, and again, we try to do that at least three times per floor. Um, and the only really critical piece there is making sure that you're uh, making sure that your team is communicating well and you're actually maintaining that six meter distance. Um, and is it perfect? No. Is it a lot better than a guess? Absolutely. Um, and so we do that uh, for each and every floor in a hotel environment um, because there's obviously a very, very critical vertical component uh, in the hospitality market. Um, because uh, again, especially with that, you know, one AP per room or one AP per every two rooms, if it's mandated, um, then you, you really need to be planning to have your, your signals go in places that you don't necessarily want it or need it. So yeah, a big part of that. All right. That's good. Um, yeah, so just a couple of examples over there on the right, that photo, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor at all, but if you can't, um, that's just a little simple tripod we use to mount mobile APs to, uh, the APs themselves are battery powered. We, we usually have a backup battery for them as well, just in case it ends up being a long day of surveying. Um, I, we almost never use the backup battery, but at least it's there. Um, we use Surface Pros just because uh, it's a nice form factor. It's an, uh, we're, we were very pleased when the, the iPad uh, app was released because it allowed us to, to reduce some weight in our kits for sure and still get the same experience. Um, and uh, that middle photo there is just a, just a demonstration of, of getting that wall wall attenuation measurement. So on one side, um, we're gathering, you know, we get NIC 60, 
opposite side, neg 63, neg 64, whatever the case may be, we note that uh, on our floor plans so that we can implement that into the Ekahau design later. Um, and over on the left there, um, this is more just to show you, you don't need a fancy setup when it comes to your AP and a stick work. We have much nicer ones now. Um, we like to use, uh, we've got some nice wheeled tripods that, uh, that take painter's poles, um, which gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of heights that we need to work with. Um, but this one here is, is just posted as an example. This one's a cheap Amazon tripod. Um, you know, maybe, I don't know, 35, 40 bucks, whatever it was. There's a piece of 90 degree PEX at the top and a PEX, like a PEX plastic NEMA box that the AP is mounted to. Um, and those two pieces at the top probably cost, you know, maybe $6 combined um, and a power source. Um, is it ideal? No, but uh, if, if you're just trying to get started with this process, that's a good way to do it. Um, and obviously there are a lot of, uh, lot of uh, post-market kits now that are available through Wi-Fi Stand and other companies like them. So yeah, so if you need to slowly work up your kit, do it that way. Um, just before I jump into design, were there any more questions about the actual survey element, like the pre-design survey? Ooh, actually, yeah, I think we actually do have something on here. Um, um, there was, uh, da, 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 there's definitely quite a few. I was going to save some of them towards the end, actually. Okay, yeah, but, no, we uh, can jump back to them. That? Why don't we do that? Because there's actually some really good questions in here um, that we've got in the queue, but I think okay. maybe we'll let you kind of Get, uh, go along and then maybe we'll probably answer a couple of these. I, I think we will. Um, Perfect. Even to the end, if we can kind of go through it. How about we do that? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So, um, so assuming we've done a good job in the survey phase and uh, we've gathered some good data, we've got it plugged into our Echo How design and now we can start, uh, now we can start placing and configuring APs um, in our plan. Um, this is, this is really helpful. I, one thing I love about Echo is the ease with which we can provide this information to our clients, um, give them really quick visual feedback because, you know, words are great, but not nearly as effective as visual aids. Um, and so when a client sees something like this, they're, they're going to, they're going to be a lot more can, you know, a lot more confident about the process that we're uh, using, um, a lot more confident about the end result. And they're going to understand that, uh, that they have something predictable at the end of this process. Um, a lot of times in hospitality Wi-Fi in previous years, um, you, it was a kind of a wild west of Wi-Fi. There was a lot, a lot of tiny little um, companies, regional companies that didn't didn't really have any Wi-Fi expertise, so to speak. Um, they just found a market that was hungry for Wi-Fi and just started deploying systems very rapidly. Um, and so there was none of the, none of this type of element where we can show, Hey, this is what we're looking at. This is what we could predict the network will look like. And we're actually going to make sure and prove it out to you in the end. Um, uh, as far as what we plan for, um, one critical piece, um, is the, the old standby of turn off two, four, two, four radios that you don't need. Um, you're going to see that a ton in hospitality because that network, that that signal spread is going to go everywhere. So let's make sure that we keep our two, four cells very contained um, because we've only got the three channels to work with. Um, again, 20 megahertz wide channels only um, with an asterisk. Sometimes in some larger meeting spaces, we have successfully implemented 40 megahertz wide channels um, just to get people on and off that medium as fast as possible. But we, we need a very clean environment for that. We need to make sure that uh, the hotel doesn't really have any external interferers or internal. Um, and you can get away with that in some instances, but 90% of the time we're sticking with 20 megahertz wide channels. Um, again, if you've got an AP in every single room, you need every channel you can get don't be afraid of using dfs um, it is your friend um, and um, based on other wn pros and my own experience um, you once in a while you'll run into a couple of channels that are a problem on dfs but um, we have found uh, unfortunately the most effective way to monitor dfs is to get the network in place and monitor for dfs events if you see them uh, and you're seeing them frequently on a particular channel, just eliminate that channel from your plan and adjust. Um, we haven't really found a good effective way to test for that beforehand. So um, part of that's because it's just not that frequent. Um, in terms of clients, iOS, um, no surprise there. You're gonna see a ton, a ton of iPhones in our networks. Um, and I've got a little visual on this next slide here. Um, so our reality, typically very closely mirrors that of just the general marketplace. Um, so over on the right, 
we've got a breakdown of our networks um, as of this year and the percentages that we're seeing in terms of client devices. So you can see there that iPhones make up nearly 50% of our client load and that's across all of our networks. Um, furthermore, we've got another chunk of 14% with iPads uh, and so on and so forth. So if we're planning and designing for iOS devices, we're already more than halfway successful. Um, and then the, over, on the, over on the left, you'll see uh, that, yeah, iPhones just in the general marketplace, they dominate. Um, so if you plan for those devices first, um, you can tweak and adjust for other devices, but you're, you're going to win the vast majority of the time if you plan for those devices as your primary. Um, channelization. So I mentioned using DFS channels. Um, definitely try to, but at the same time, uh, because we're in a hotel environment, because everything's BYOD, um, you know, there's potential that there'll be, there potentially could be a fair number of devices that won't even support DFS channels. So we want to make sure that there's still connectivity options for them. Um, so, and this is, I'll do this definitely more in smaller hotels, you know, 200 rooms or less. Um, and we'll look to stagger uni one and three channels, um, which are pretty much uh, supported across the board uh, any device that can handle five gig connectivity um, and and stagger them with uni2 channels to help make sure that there's something that they can connect to no matter where they are in the hotel um, yeah meeting spaces um, a lot of times you're dealing with high ceiling height, ceiling heights um, so we'll often use patch antennas um, but in some other instances, we'll use down tilt omnis. Um, and in, in a case uh, where Stu mentioned earlier, kind of some of the aesthetic um, requirements, um, there have been times, uh, I don't recommend this as a primary option, um, but there have been a few instances where we've actually hidden patch antennas, and this again pains me to say, but hidden patch antennas behind drywall um, with an easy access to it for servicing um, and actually kind of side fired into a room. So um you know it isn't so go ahead yeah go ahead say it isn't so <laughs> yeah say it isn't so um and that in, in that case it ended up being the kind of the best of the worst options um because the drywall itself wasn't a big attenuator um and because we we didn't have any ceiling options we didn't have any angled options um and the in this case um going from the sides uh you know pretty much at accessible height um, the crowd itself uh, in the room would help attenuate our signal uh, and a and good channel plan helps make sure that the, the different clients are connecting to the AP that we want them to connect to. So um, again, not, not, a not a recommended solution, um, but there are times when you just, you, you, the client is re refuses, w whether it's their own choice or some, you know, some outside force that uh, mandates it, um, you do need to get pretty wildly creative at times. Um, and then uh, a mention that I'll make because I've made this mistake before, uh, accordion walls <laughs> in some large meeting spaces, are they're off, you know, I've seen them at like neg 18, neg 20. Um, you wouldn't believe it. Some of those, uh, they're, you know, panels full of aluminum. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it, could, it could be easy to miss if you're surveying and the walls are all folded up. Um, so make sure you factor them into your designs if you're, uh, if you're trying to make sure that your conference coverage is, is excellent. Um, in terms of our channel plan, uh, we stick with static channel plans almost every time, I would say 95% plus. Um, there are a few instances where we do deployments in environments that have a lot of, um, you know, some outdoor APs and some use of mesh. Um, again, we don't recommend mesh in any case, but uh, sometimes you're forced to. Um, and in some instances with mesh, we will use some, some auto RF or, or radio resource management to help manage that because the environment changes a little more frequently. Um, but when we're talking about in-building Wi-Fi, we're statically planning all of our channels. Um, and, oh yeah, sorry. Um, just got a little sidetracked there for a moment. Um, uh, five gig radios versus two, four. Um, one of the questions that, uh, Abishak had thrown my way earlier was talking about like, oh, do you use any type of, um, do you type of band steering? And absolutely we do. Um, but one thing, um, and I can't take credit for this, picked it up from, uh, from other people in the community, um, was even though in some instances we're allowed to have a 2.4 specific SSID, um, typically we still enable 5 gig on that quote unquote 2.4 SSID. We just name it as such. 
Um, and you'll, you'll be surprised how many clients will actually connect with five gig radios and they're trying to connect to the two, four gig SSID. Um, but most hotels, uh, mandate a single SSID. Um, and in those instances, we, um, we do turn on van steering and try to direct as many clients as possible to the five gig radios. Um, and another way we encourage good client behavior um, is to make sure we have at least a six dB spread between our two, four radios and our five gig radios. Um, and more often than not, uh, clients, you know, even though uh, they, they can make a lot of bad decisions, it'll help them make good decisions that way. And the the ever important backhaul. Um, this is probably going to be pretty elementary for most, if not everybody listening in. But um, it, it goes without saying, if you don't have uh, if you don't have a good backhaul connection for your network, um, it, it won't really matter what you have in inside the building. Um, you could have great great channel plan. You could have great AP placement. You could have everything at peak efficiency. Um, but if it can't get through that pipe at the end, it won't really matter. You're still going to see poor user experience. Um, now, there are instances, especially us up here in Canada, um, we work with a handful of properties that are up in the far north, um, like above the Arctic Circle, um, and their connectivity options are extremely limited. Um, and so in those instances, um, we actually do, again, everything's it depends, um, rate limiting. Uh, it's not something we typically encourage or do um, uh, in the vast majority of our installations. Uh, but in instances where you have extremely limited bandwidth options for your backhaul, uh, we have used rate limiting before to help ensure that the hotel isn't totally overblowing their bandwidth caps. Um, you're, you're talking about potentially tens of thousands of dollars in overages in some of these cases. And so even though the user experience is relatively poor, um, they can at least offer Wi-Fi service to their guests um, without it being, uh, you know, without without it crushing their their uh, their revenue streams. So, um, IPTV, um, IPTV, I find has more of a negative impact in terms of. Um, uh, your, your saturation when it comes to bandwidth, um, as opposed to the, the contrast with handheld devices. Um, uh, a lot of times in Wi-Fi, um, in the hospitality side of it, um, we'll hear about these, you know, these bandwidth hog families that come in and destroy the network. You know, we've got uh, two parents and two kids and they've all got five devices. Um, and while those are entertaining to imagine, the, the reality is, um, there really isn't anyone that actually does that. Even a family with five devices each, yeah, they're bringing them in, but they're not all streaming 4K video at once on five devices each. Um, and so <laughs> in the same way, um, in the same way uh, salespeople on the vendor side of, you know, APs and whatnot, they're trying to put the best foot forward and say, oh, you need this, you need this, you need multi-gig, you need, you know, whatever, 2.5 gigabits per second. Um, the, the reality is that that's not uh, gonna be the case. Um, but we have seen where uh, hotels are offering IPTV over the WLAN. Um, if they do have 4K enabled TVs and people are actually using, you know, say 4K Netflix and whatnot, um, that is definitely going to have a significant strain because you're getting true 4K uh, streaming versus, um, versus that when you contrast it with a mobile device where it's actually going to get uh, down clipped um, and it's not using the same bandwidth that you would get in a different situation. So if you need to offer streaming TV services over the Wi-Fi network, that pipe needs to be nice and big. And then finally our deployment and validation. So we've, we've, uh, the, the customer understands the process. They understand the value. Um, we are aware of the brand standards that are mandated, you know, what, you know, where we need signal to be at the cell edge, how many APs, uh, if there is that mandated, it's in there. Um, and we have taken all that information, we've gone through our design and we've got the bomb, we've ordered the material and it's ready to go. So um, collaboration with the, with the hotel staff is absolutely critical. They need to understand that we need to get everywhere and we need to get there in a timely fashion to A, minimize disruption to their guests um, and minimize disruption to the overall um, operations in the hotel. Um, so we, we laid out pretty clearly with our project management team, uh, and they will have a day-to-day -day schedule, uh, indicating what rooms need to be accessed between and what times they need to be accessed at. Um, the actual AP deployments themselves are typically pretty straightforward. 
um, in a lot of ways, those are the easiest parts to, to coordinate because there's, there's an understood beginning and an end. Once you, know, you go into the room, the AP gets installed, and once it's in place, it's done. Um, whereas the, the follow-up survey, that's where things, that's where it can be a little more challenging. Um, but, uh, one benefit again, with, uh, some of the new, new features that Echo rolled out, uh, you know, not that long ago with Echo Connect, um, is the, the, the collaboration ability when you've got a few different technicians surveying at once and you're updating to the cloud in real time. Um, in the past, uh, if we wanted to have multiple techs surveying on a single site, um, we would kind of have to take these semi-frequent breaks to, to re-coordinate, uh, confirm who's covered which rooms, when, where, and how, um, and then kind of update our list and move on. And at times, that could take 15, you know, 10, 15 minutes each and every time instead of being in rooms gathering data. Um, now, with that collaborative real-time ability, um, we can have multiple techs going in and out of rooms between check checkout and check-in times. Um, and we don't have to constantly be communicating with one another to, to determine who's been where. Um, you just look at the map in real time and you know, go, okay, oh, we're good on second floor. We're good on 10th. I can move on to you know, A, B, or C, whatever the case may be. Um, and yeah, you can actually cover a lot of ground and gather a lot of data really, really quickly. Um, and so working with the staff to make sure you can get in and out of rooms fast, that's, that's going to be, your, that's gonna be the, the, the best way to make sure you can get this work done. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's really good because, um, you know, like is like you touched on a, a really good point is when you're in a hotel room, like sometimes you just can't get into a room or, you know, you've got like four rooms on one floor and then, and then you've got multiple other floors that you can get to, but you need to get to them all at the same time. And uh, when you mentioned it with that connect, that's actually, you know, not like a, a shameless plug, but it was more of like, is I can go out there, I can have two to three um, people out there, technicians to go out there and capture the survey data, right? And then it's all merged into one file. So you're, you know, you're, it's almost like you're cloning yourself, you know? Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's, uh, it's very helpful in terms of time management. Um, you know, in the past, obviously we still did it. We would take our files and we'd merge them so we have a singular file to review. Um, but being able to do it in real time does, it does save a significant amount of time on site, um, which is valuable for everyone, every stakeholder. Um, and then just really quickly here, this just kind of wraps up our validation piece. Um, networks that we don't deploy, we're often brought in to, to test them and vet them and whatnot. Um, and uh, <laughs> just make sure you're, you're following just standard best practices. You know, have a channel plan, um, 20 megahertz wide channels, appropriate cell sizes. So, you know, make sure that you're not blasting your, your radios everywhere. Um, this was from an installation that happened um, in early 2019. I'm not going to name names in terms of the hotel brand or the or the Wi-Fi provider, um, but this was a production network that had been uh, in place for about three and a half, almost four months, um, and they, you know, to the surprise of no one looking at this, they they were having tons and tons of issues, um, and I, I I realized looking at this the my you know, explanation of how, what the color references. It just means that everywhere that's red, there's at least 10 audible radios. Um, so just horrifying in terms of, uh, of, of co-channel overlap. Um, it just, uh, yeah, it didn't work at all. Um, we made a few simple recommendations and they went from endless complaints and endless issues to a, a relatively painless experience for their guests afterwards. Uh, and it wouldn't be a good hospitality chat without talking about some of the uh, some of the fun we walk into. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of times uh, IT infrastructure is the bottom of the pile when it comes to um, priority. So, yeah, so it turns into a garbage dump or otherwise. Um, yeah, and uh, a particular favorite of mine is the the bathroom MDF. That's also very very helpful for a busy IT professional. Just lock the door and get her done, gentlemen. Um, yeah. And, and I, I can't see any issues with the picture on the left. So I don't know. What do you see, Stu? What do you think? Well, uh, you know, it's, uh, I've seen something similar before. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure, probably everyone listening has seen something similar, but I, I find it particularly <laughs> terrifying in hospitality. Yeah. A stack of papers. What could go wrong? I think in, in a lot of hospitality and a lot of even some small business that this is a very common thing where the cable plant is often overlooked like it's not it's it's kind of put on the side burner 
And the cable plant is really important, not just for wireless, but everything else that the hotel um, would have to use in terms of um, a data connection to any of anything that they have, um, door readers, card readers, anything they got. So this is always something that, you know, shouldn't be overlooked in my opinion, but. Absolutely. Oh, for sure. Yeah. If, uh, again, that's part of the uh, education component. If, uh, if hotel operators and managers and staff can understand the value that the infrastructure brings, um, hopefully it'll be treated a little bit better in the future. For sure. Yeah. And, and, and if Stephen Montgomery is just, uh, uh, paying this and said, yeah, he sees them in housekeeping closets a lot too. And yeah, for sure. They're definitely in, in housekeeping, uh, storage. Sometimes they're in a, one of those housekeeping closets where there's like, um, there's water, you know, constantly. Yes. Really the moisture level in there is, uh, is pretty high. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. So your initial site walk is critical in identifying some of those potential hazards and making sure that you plan around it. And hopefully, hopefully in most cases you can come up with a much better solution than the, than the, um, the status quo. Um, yeah. So just conclusion. Um, assumptions are made about Wi-Fi, got to educate and inform uh, the stakeholders. If they don't understand uh, what they can do and how they should do Wi-Fi, uh, it's going to be difficult for them to have a, a positive experience in the end for their guests. Um, number two, um, even though you may have cookie cutter plans uh, from a brand and it might look like these, you know, multiple buildings are the same, um, you still want to actually test and validate and make sure that they are in fact the same or close to the same. So survey, survey, survey. Um, number three, designing the network for consumer devices. Um, if you look to keep on track with the most current and most common client devices, um, design for them. Um, and you can look, the nice thing is now you can, it's pretty easy to look at different trends um, released by a lot of different uh, public research firms. Um, Cisco being one of them, they, they release uh, in kind of state of the internet reports every single year. Um, if you're more worried about three years down the road than you are about today, then plan for those devices that are coming up the curve. You know, the, the iPhone that was released this year, that's going to be the most common in three years almost every single time. So you can plan for that. Um, finally, uh, successful implementations, you got to work closely with the staff. Um, if they don't understand the value of the process, they're not going to be on board and they're going to make your job harder. So get uh, in the good books with the hotel staff. Um, and finally, um, even if all your budgets are very stripped and very, very, uh, you know, they're under pressure, don't skip the validation phase. Um, if there's any single piece of hotel Wi-Fi design and deployment, um, that will, that will cover your ass and make a great experience for everyone that's using the Wi-Fi network. Um, it's that validation survey and, t and your adjustments and your tuning. Um, that's that. Thanks everybody. Wow. Wow. Thank you very much, Garrett. I mean, this was, uh, this was really good. I loved it. Um, we have a lot of questions, um, in the offer <laughs> and, uh, and, and they're really good ones. Um, we've got some great, um, some great questions that, uh, I'm going to highlight a few of them that are actually pretty good and we can, and, uh, we'll probably be able, some of them actually we probably answered live. Um, one question, um, stood out, which is really good. Um, this one was by uh, Chris Reed and it says, are refresh cycles and redesigns driven by the local hotel management or does that come from brand directives as well? Like is, I guess is the, is the, is the vendor coming in? It's a mix. It's a mix of both for sure. Um, in, in more independent situations, um, we find that, well, A, with our clients, we actually, we try to be ahead of it. Um, if we're seeing that the infrastructure is aging, uh, we're starting to see a higher incidence of support issues, uh, maybe higher incidence of hardware failure, we're obviously going to encourage a refresh. Um, but there's a lot of times as well um, where the infrastructure is fine. Um, the network is operating well, uh, guests are having a great experience, but the brand has mandated a change either, either they've elected to go with a specific vendor or, you know, a couple of vendors, for example. Um, and the, the hotel, uh, in question doesn't have that particular vendor. Um, they will force a change. Um, but thankfully in those instances, most hotels, um, and we've seen this across a wide variety of brands, uh, and management groups, um, is if they have a, if they have a well-functioning network, um, they can often get, uh, get exceptions, um, or waivers and maintain operation of those networks for a given period of time before they're forced to make a change. Um, so yeah, it, it, it comes from both sides. There's not something that's hard and fast when it comes to that. 
Oh yeah, for sure. Now we've got another one here that's more of a um, statement, I guess, but uh, it's actually because some good feedback is um, step four uh, says we rarely get hotels to pay for a survey. Uh, most motel customers just want us to provide a design based off their fire plans that, you know, been copied 17 times. We use survey <laughs> software, you know, on properties that have strict brand standards and require the hotel to pay for these things, right? So, I mean, yeah, it's, I guess in, even in my experience, I mean, I've, I've seen it's, um, that is usually the case. They probably just want it wireless and they don't, want a survey is that something that you see as well um yeah it, there are there are instances where uh the budgets are so strict that they just they say they don't even want it um in those instances typically we're going to do it anyways in some fashion um again because we can we can very rapidly survey uh, a given space using using ekahau um particularly uh in tandem with a sidekick um, we can get in and out and at least, you know, 30, 40, 50% of the rooms in a, you know, depending on the size of the hotel, of course, but typically when we're talking about hotels that just say they don't want it, we're probably talking about a small hotel, um, with very limited budgets and it won't take a lot of time to get it anyways. Um, and in our case, because we're a managed provider and we provide 24 seven support services, um, to hotels post install, um, there's a benefit to us to, to gathering that data regardless so that we can adjust the network. The better the network works, um, the better it is for our team uh, in terms of support volume, the better it is for the hotel in terms of happy guests um, and those revenues come in. Um, but it, as far as how is approach it in terms of uh, pricing, um, we generally don't have a separate price for post uh, surveys. Um, they are just built into the installation services um, and if we know that we have to, if we know we have to trim somewhere, uh, in terms of survey work, um, it's, it's more often going to be, um, at the front end. Um, but I have to use the, it depends scenario. Once again, um, if you're working with poor data at the beginning, or if you're working with the, I think you, you said like fire escape plans that have been copied 17 times. Um, uh, there are, there are challenges there that sometimes just can't be overcome. Um, and then it's, a, and then it's about managing your customer expectations. Uh, you know, good data in good data out, um, appropriate budget, uh, allocated means appropriate results. So, um, I don't have a, I don't have a, a, a magic answer for that, unfortunately. Um, but if you, but yeah, you, there's still value in trying to do at least some survey work post install, even if the client says they don't want it or need it. Mm hmm. Uh, I've got one other interesting questions here. Um, this is from Peter Rock. Considering the floor plan attenuation is probably closer to 20 dB and higher, have you found any success placing APs in a staggered pattern from one floor to another? And the second part of it, in my experience working in hotels, I have found not found any advantage to this as compared compared to placing them in vertical alignment where APs are placed in every other room in a typical size hotel room. Um, I hope I followed that properly. Um, question being, as I understood it, was that uh, the question was, um, do you ever count on vertical um, signal propagation versus horizontal signal propagation? Um, and there are times where, yeah, uh, especially in smaller hotels, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure what the code is in the States. I'm sure it's pretty similar, but, uh, you know, if you're talking about a four floor hotel with a hundred rooms, there's a good chance it's going to be matchstick or, you know, it's going to be lumber construction as opposed to steel and concrete. Um, and there's a lot of instances where, um, you don't have a, a very, you know, substantial, uh, signal loss going floor to floor. Um, and in those instances, sometimes we'll even deploy APs every third room. Um, and have a alternating uh, deployment plan where you know on floor one uh, you're in you're in room one four etc uh, with that gap room and then on the opposite floors you're going to be in the middle of that um, and oftentimes you're going to have coverage side to side obviously um, but you'll also have that coverage from from uh, above and below um, and in that instance if you do that type of pattern uh, you'll also have some um, some redundancy there if an AP fails or gets you know dropped off for some reason, um, you'll likely still have coverage from a neighboring AP for that particular room, uh, 
you know, while it's getting repaired or replaced. All right. Oh, definitely some good ones. Uh, oh, this is a good one here. Um, for the frequent travelers in a room, what is, what, what's the best way to give feedback uh, to a local hotel or brand about poor Wi-Fi experience? So what, what have you found that's been uh, helpful? Um, obviously, you get front of it, right? You feel like, oh, it's not working. Yeah, exactly. People just want to throw in the towel. And I understand that as a, as a fellow, you know, traveler myself and having to, I spend probably too much time in hotels. <laughs> That's what happens when you work in the, in the sector. Um, yeah. When it doesn't work well, it's super frustrating. Um, and you know, it, being WLAN pros, everyone knows the few little simple tricks you can do to help try to make sure that you get an appropriate connection to a, to an AP that's actually nearby, especially in a, in a poorly planned network. Um, but when it doesn't work well, um, a, uh, you want to check to see if there is uh, live support for the network. If there is, um, I can't speak for every provider, but I can say for ours that our hold times are under a minute. So, you know, try that. Um, but at an absolute minimum, make sure you're communicating with the hotel staff. They, they feel it the most. They want to make your stay uh, beneficial and helpful. Um, so they'll pass it on to management as needed. Um, and if, if there's one thing we know, uh, once hotel management believes there is an issue, they're going to do everything in their power to correct it. Um, so if you've got a particularly, um, you know, you've got a favorite hotel that you stay at, but it's, you know, it's your favorite despite poor Wi-Fi. Um, just kindly let them know, um, Hey, you know, there's a few things with this Wi-Fi network that I think could use an update. Um, you should let your, you should let your service vendor know, um, that this is not working very well for, for myself and some other guests. And, uh, in our case, uh, we track those issues, uh, via our ticketing portal. Um, and we're always looking for trends to, to make sure that we're, you know, recovering potentially, um, potentially missed issues. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, Abhishek, do you see anything else that's, uh, that's, that's uh, glaring that we haven't, um, that we may have already touched on that we, I'm just going through some of the questions here. I know most of them have been answered live during the slides. Yes, that's what I thought too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the slides are pretty uh, informative to be honest. A lot of people are asking for it. So of course, yep. Garrett, if you have your permission or if you uh, want to send that out later on or something. I mean, we have uh, a recording of it, so it's kind of uh, there for everybody yep. to see. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We can share the slides out. Yeah, it's not a problem. Uh, yeah, they're, they were purposely wordy, quote unquote. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, that's actually way better. I mean, yeah, for post have, for post reference. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and if, if there's any questions that we didn't cover that somebody really wants to get answered, don't hesitate. Uh, just jump onto Twitter, fire me a message. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, and if I can't answer them, I'm going to find someone that can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. So this is, uh, this is great. I think usually we uh, will post it on a, on a page later that you can actually view the slides um, and then uh, go through that. But there were some, definitely some good questions. I think we, we, we did, you know, touch on quite a bit that was in there as well. Um, and definitely some were more of just kind of a uh, helpful hints and stuff like that. So, um, I can see there was one, we got a little bit of, uh, we're just kind of going over a little bit of time, but, um, uh, da, 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 there was one here that was really good, um, that I passed by here. Let me just see. We talked about that. Oh, okay. Now, so, um, one guy asked, okay, um, when you're doing your survey um, on AP on a stick, um, yep. surveys, um, they mentioned what type of power that we, you were using. Um, ah, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, we all have a, a setting of power that we want to use. Um, you know, Absolutely. So, so yeah, why don't you... Um, so all things being equal, um, we're going to be our, that mobile AP is going to be broadcasting on five gig. We don't, we don't actually do attenuation testing on two, four. Um, we always approach two, four from a best effort perspective. Um, it's just typically far less important. Um, there are exceptions to that, of course, but at nine times out of 10, um, we're testing five gig only, um, in terms of attenuation surveying. Um, and we're going to have our little mobile AP set to 10 dBm. 
Um, now there's a lot of spaces where that's actually too much. Um, and sometimes, uh, we will, depending on the, uh, the sensitivity of the client, um, and again, budgets, uh, budgets being accounted for, um, where it actually makes more sense to, to tone that down a little bit. Um, I wouldn't say that we'd ever turn it up more than that for that testing, but, um, but yeah, 10 dBm on the five gig radio is typically what we're using for our attenuation surveys. Um, when it comes to AP on a stick with the actual AP model, um, well, in that case, we're actually going to go and quickly do a, a, you know, a quick mini predictive um, of, the, of the floor plan um, and just get a general idea of where we think we need to be, uh, and particularly when you're talking about the, the, an instance where you have to have an AP in every single room. Um, and in those cases, uh, it could be you know, much lower than that. Um, and we might, we might start, the, start the dial at 6 dBm, for example. Um, do our AP on a stick testing and then find, oh, actually we need it to be a little bit higher or a little bit lower based on our cell sizing and shape. So that's something that you potentially have to tweak during your AP on a stick testing. That's, that's a big reason why we do it. So we can get that fine tuning done on the fly so that when we deploy the APs um, and we do our design, we're all, we've already made those adjustments uh, on that side of things. Well, that's, that's good. Yeah. Cause like if you, you want to make sure, so that you know that you're, that you're moving that AP around, it's 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 set, it's ready to go, and it doesn't change you. Yeah, absolutely. And if we do, like, so um, one of the earlier slides just showed a, showed uh, the cell sizing from an AP and a stick test. Mm -hmm. um, if we do make any changes, um, we just throw a quick note nope. into ACAO indicating that the AP when it was placed, you know, at, at location A was at setting A, and same thing when we move over to B, we 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 note any changes that are made from one to the other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we have some keeners here are actually um, looking at your desktop and uh, they see the little Wi-Fi um, uh, tool up on the top on your uh, toolbar. And the question of what that was. Um, oh, I don't, gotcha. But I'll let yeah. you explain it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just a handy, handy app from Adrian Granados called uh, Wi-Fi Signal. Um, if you don't have his apps, get them, get all of them, uh, assuming you're a Mac user. Um, his other tools are Wi-Fi Explorer and Wi-Fi Explorer Pro um, and AirTool, which is a, a handy uh, packet capture tool that uh, is Mac native. And we did have a, um, another one with, um, with you taking on the... Um, uh, the sidekick and you mentioned using the sidekick in many of the, um, the designs that you're doing. Um, how has that improved your workflow since like, since the sidekicks come along since going from the dongle to the, the sidekick? Oh, uh, like one especially thing I can say, down, especially from top, right? yeah, so. yeah, I was going to say, um, from a hotel perspective, if you're talking about having challenges with surveying a hotel environment, um, we can move a lot quicker without worrying about, you know, knocking off a Nick or, you know, bumping it awkwardly. Um, we don't have to have survey trays. Um, we still do use very small ones for our, uh, for our input device. Um, but the sidekick's a lot easier to maneuver around with. Um, so I, like this is only anecdotal. I can't say for sure, but I would say there's probably a good 15 to 20% um, improvement in speed of surveying, uh, if not higher. Um, and that's, that's one of the biggest differences we notice. And, and obviously not having to, not having to stop really at all. Uh, during the process because because of that time sensitivity we try to minimize breaks when we're when we've got room access um, and obviously if if the the if the batteries on our devices are going to outlast our open windows then that's that benefits everybody okay i'm wow, just trying to get through all of these uh these questions so this is good uh man i don't know i do we do we we have enough time for questions i mean uh i think we can go uh, on. I don't know. Do you, you you probably have to go I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> i'm uh, good for a bit longer no worries yeah this obviously went over time but uh, yeah, i apologize for being long-winded <laughs> we still have uh we still have quite a few people on the uh on the line which is good so um okay. i'm gonna do i'm gonna just try to it, um, Abishak, um, is there something that stands out that there that we could probably end off on a really good question? Um, yeah, so uh, a lot of people always have asked me what's better, do uh, continuous or stop and go? Uh, so, yeah. Uh, do you, yeah, do you stick to a specific method of serving or do you mix and match? Or is we, it, sorry to cut you off there. Um, no, that's fine. 
Yep. We, uh, the short answer is we use both. Um, but the vast majority of the time we're using continuous survey. Um, and that, like I said, speed is critical, um, in a hospitality environment. Um, but in a troubleshooting scenario, um, stop and go is really, ha really handy because we want very precise readings from very specific locations. Right. Um, and so it, that <laughs> it wouldn't be the first tech to, uh, to actually hop up onto a bed and get a stop and go survey right there. Um, yeah, there's just little instances where, where that stop and go is helpful. Um, and particularly if we have to, um, if we need to do a little bit of remote work with somebody that potentially has either never or rarely used Ekahau, um, it's very easy for us to engage a remote tech and have them go through that process and, and, and know that the data is going to be good. Um, when you're talking about continuous surveying, there is a bit of a learning curve there. Um, and while it's, uh, it's our preferred method, if you're talking about someone that's new to the product or, or just using it once in a very, you know, very long time span, um, right. that stop and go is really helpful to ensuring you've got the right data in the right place on the map. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And, uh, oh, I think this was another one we, that I think this definitely is good for the hotel piece is how about installing an AP above for wooden ceiling um, or when you have AC and duct work around and, and in a hotel you have a lot of duct work, especially yeah. when you enter a room. And, and I think that this is kind of, it, it's not as if it depends, it's, it's kind of, okay, well, does the, will the AP work here? You have to almost test it, right? And you have to kind of see if it's going to work. But uh, one thing as I might like want to add is that putting an, an AP above the ceiling, make sure it's accessible with a proper enclosure uh, um, that's accessible to get to, like something that's nicely aesthetic, um, or but don't hide it in such a way that it may break a fire code of some sort. Um, it's like any electrical device, right? You don't want to hide it. Yeah, certainly. There's a, uh, a lot of potential problems with um, APs in, like physically in the ceiling. Um, you know, mo most people that work in Wi-Fi know that the potential um, negative impacts to the actual RF itself, um, it makes things less predictable. Um, so it's been like, have we done it in the past? Yes. Uh, based on brand mandates. Um, but it's been a few years actually, since we've deployed APs in, um, the ceiling. Um, but if you're forced to, like Stu mentioned, um, there are some pretty, pretty solid, um, in ceiling enclosures now, um, from a few different, uh, few different manufacturers and they are pricey. Um, but if you get the right enclosures, um, you're not going to have those negative RF impacts that you would if you just stuck it in the ceiling and, you know, had like, say like a metal opening or something like that. Um, you'll, you'll have a lot more, you'll have a lot more success. Um, if, if aesthetics are critical to make sure that there's some additional budget allocated to hiding or covering the APs. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely good. Wow, I mean, um, we've really gone a bit uh, a bit over time. I mean, there's so many uh, really good questions. We almost like have to do a follow up, but um, this is this was really good. Um, um, there's so much more um, info in here um, that we could probably go on for a, an another webinar. <laughs> yeah, uh, but in any event, um, uh, I think uh, Abishag, I think we're pretty good to to wrap it up. What do you think? Yep, yep. No. It's like a good right. point too. Yeah. And I mean, of course, this is a really interesting conversation, you know, really interesting way to design Wi-Fi for hotels, hospitality. I mean, this is something that I learned today, you know, a lot of new stuff. So, of course. Excellent, you know, guys. Absolutely. Yeah, no, there's, there's definitely some interesting stuff that was in there for sure. And I mean, I've done a small little tiny motel once before and I was like, okay, this is interesting, but not being able to get into rooms, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you learn you learn to work your way into all all corners of hotels as you as you work with them more and more and more. So, yes. yeah, and I I appreciate everyone tuning in and all the questions for sure. And again, if uh, we didn't cover anything here, but you you want to send something my way, feel free on Twitter to do that. All right. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you guys very much. And um, and this is the end of the come up the end of the show. We. Um, We'll have the video posted and you guys can look for it there. So, yes. Okay. Yeah, so we do have a recording going on. So it will be posted on our official YouTube page. Yes. All right. So Abhishek, you can go ahead and stop the recording and. Um, All righty.